Greetings from First United Methodist Church of Los Alamos, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. We have now resumed in-person worship with one service at 10 a.m., which is live streamed both on Facebook and on YouTube. We alternate each week between contemporary and traditional music. You may confirm worship times and receive more information by visiting our website, firstinyourheart.org. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. After hearing of John the Baptist's arrest and execution, Jesus and the disciples retreat to a quiet place but are overwhelmed by a large group which leads Jesus to the feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. One of my earliest memories, probably around four, I was spending the day with my grandmother, and we had gone grocery shopping, and we stopped at Tasty Freeze on the way back home. And we'd placed our order, and we were waiting for it to arrive. And I looked down, and there was a tarantula sitting on my arm right here. And I don't know how big that spider actually was, because number one, I was four, and number one, it terrified me. But in my memory, it was, it was big. And I screamed, and my grandmother turned around. I was sitting in the back seat. We had, she had a 1966 Ford Galaxy 500, if you remember that. It was a huge aircraft carrier, especially when the top was down. And she swatted the spider off my arm, and I can remember this, it jumped onto the front seat, ran down the front seat, jumped onto the dashboard, and then squiggled into an air conditioning vent. And my grandmother, as we told that story, would always say, and I never saw it again. We didn't even stay to pick up our order from Tasty Freeze, we drove home, and said, so the groceries are sitting right next to me. I have to have on a, a bright yellow shirt with a puffy lion. I can still remember this. And there was a bunch of bananas sitting on top of the, the bag. And so our best guess is the tarantula had come out of the bananas, saw another yellow thing, and came over to check out what was going on. And so the moral of this story is I think that FDR, in his inaug first inaugural address, when he said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, was wrong. We might fear fear, but we should also fear spiders. And while I can say I still can't deal with tarantulas or other large spiders, I've gotten much better at dealing with the smaller ones that come into the house. And so with that, we move on to our series on the knots of Jesus. That is the things that Jesus tells us not to do with today's injunction of do not be afraid. And of the things that we are not to do, or the things that we often tie ourselves in knots up about, not fearing might be one of the hardest not to do. And living entirely without fear is actually not 
only unhealthy, it's downright dangerous. There's a reason why we have fear of spiders and of snakes and of tigers, because they can be life-threatening to us. And so fear is a primal urge that we all have. It comes from the most primitive part of the brain, the amygdala, which is located at the base of the spine, close, uh, base of the brain close to the spine. And it's what triggers the fight, flight, or freeze response. When we sense danger, it triggers and we have an emotional response to it. That has played an important role in keeping us alive as individuals and as a species since we came around. Free, fear in proper doses or in natural occurrences is healthy and productive. It teaches us not to touch hot stoves or to play in the streets and to avoid spiders. And so fearing things is not a sin. And in fact, fearing or living with fear can be healthy, can lead us away from danger, and, not, and living without fear can be just downright stupid sometimes. And so we start with the reality that when Jesus says, do not be afraid, I don't think that that fear that we normally think of is what he's always talking about when he says, do not be afraid. It's about the what and the why. So Jesus gives around 125 injunctions that we have in the gospel passage, things to do or not do in this case. And of those, 21 are about not being afraid or of taking heart, showing courage, things along those lines. And of course, the first thing the angels announce, how the New Testament begins is the angels appearing and saying, do not be afraid, right? Fear not. And additionally, we, when we look in the Hebrew Bible, there are more than 100 injunctions there saying, do not be afraid. And so that leads us in, in today's story with the, Jesus telling the disciples that with a little setup. First, as Kathy says in the introduction to the, to the passage, what happens immediately before this story is that Jesus feeds the 5,000 with some, a couple of fish and a couple of loaves, right? Can you think of another time, besides for Jesus, another time in Scripture in which we have a miraculous feeding of a, a crowd? Go way back to Exodus. Right? Manna from the wilderness with Moses, right? You've got to keep Moses in, in the story as we're thinking about this. And so then we also have to know that the last time the disciples were in a boat, which is in chapter 8 in Matthew, they too there encounter an enormous storm. Jesus is sleeping at the time, and they're terrified for their lives that they're going to die. And they wake Jesus up, and Jesus calms the storm. And so you have to imagine that based on past experience, what the last time they were in a boat... Bad things happen to them. They're not really excited about getting in a boat again, right? You might have been on a terrible flight and you had, you know, really bad turbulence. The next time you get on the flight and that plane starts shaking a little bit, you're like, oh, God, it's happening again, right? So I can imagine that the disciples are not really all that excited about getting back on this boat. And we're told that because of the, the, there's an interesting piece in the first line of this passage. It's really easy to overlook. And it says, Jesus made them get into the boat. Perhaps they didn't actually want to be separated from Jesus. This is the first time since they've been called that they've been away from Jesus. Or maybe, again, they're afraid to get back in the boat because of what happened last time, or they want to do or go somewhere else. But Jesus makes them. He forces them into the boat. And they go off onto the sea, and then he goes up a mountain. Another Moses theme to keep in order. And so the disciples, it appears, get past their fear, or what I'm thinking is of their fear of going back into a boat. And maybe they deserve a little bit of credit for that. Even if Jesus forces them, they, they actually follow it. And then they set out. And what happens? 
another storm arises. And if what the disciples fear the most is what occurs. And we're told in the New Revised Standard Version that we heard that the boat is being battered. The Greek word actually says the boat is being tortured. So you can imagine what is happening in this. And this is happening at the darkest part of the night. Again, it just says early in the morning in the NRSV. The New International Version says in the fourth watch, which is between 3 and 6 a.m. So sort of the darkest part of the night is when this is occurring for them. And then, to give some more context, you have to understand within a a Jewish understanding, which we look at in Hebrew scripture, is that the water is seen as chaos, uncontrolled chaos. Again, think Genesis 1-1, that God separates the water, and then the, the voice, the wind of God The Spirit of God moves across the waters. He's bringing order into the world, but the the waters are still sort of considered this untamed chaos that exists in the world. And so the only thing that can overcome that chaos is God or a, a deity, right? And so then when they look out and the boat is being tortured, it's black, and they see this form walking on the water, they imagine what is this? Is, this is not human, right? There's something going on here that's beyond our comprehension, and they're even more terrified of what it is. But Jesus immediately speaks to them, we're told. They don't talk, ask what this thing is, say, who are you? Matthew says, Jesus immediately says to them, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And again, we miss something in the translation here because of the verb construction of of verb tenses in Greek that don't translate into English. But the words that Matthew uses here for it is I are exactly the same words that that get used in Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible from the Exodus story when Moses says, who are you? Who should I say is sending me? And God gives us what is Y-H-W-H, sometimes uh, pronounced Yahweh, right? We add in uh, vowels that are not actually there, known as a tetragrammaton, I am. So when God says to Moses, I am, those are exactly the same words that Jesus says to the disciples on the boat. So we have this other Moses piece, because one of the things that Matthew is doing is saying, yeah, Moses was the great prophet and lawgiver, but guess what? Jesus is even greater. Moses could part the waters. Jesus walks on them, bringing order out of chaos. And so he says, do not be afraid. Jesus is taming the chaos around them, although we're not told that the storm is calmed. So it's still being battered or tortured when they see this. And Jesus says, do not be afraid. And so Peter says, if it's you, perhaps there's some doubt still there for Peter. If it's you, command me to come out onto the water. Now, doesn't that seem a little ridiculous? If you're in the middle of a storm on a boat... Are you thinking about what's really going to be great is if I could walk, step out of this boat. And yet, I don't think that Peter is being his normal, impetuous self here. A number of years ago, the then COO of Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg, wrote a book entitled Lean In, which was about uh, equality in the workplace and increasing the number of women in leadership positions, but sort of lost that original term, and lean in became this business buzzword that everybody was talking about. And I think that term, though, is important here. Because when you get scared, what do you do? You lean backwards, right? You're taking a shower. For some reason, spiders love showers and bathtubs. Not quite sure why. But when you're taking a shower and you see that spider coming down on its web, do you lean forward into it? No, you step back and you scream, right? That's what we do when we get scared. You don't lean into these things. 
When we're afraid, we lean back, we shy away, we pull away, we run away. But when we lean into something, we put an entirely different look on it. And when you pull back from the world, the world pulls back from you. And when you lean in, the world leans in. And I think that's what Peter is deciding to do here. And again, I think maybe we should praise him a little bit. Because last week I said, you know, 100% of the disciples doubted. And so it's okay to, to have doubts. Here, 92% of the disciples stayed in the boat. Only one gets out. Only one has faith to step out into this chaos, to, to face what terrifies him. And he walks on the water. Right? For a moment, he is walking towards Jesus. Peter walks on the water. And then what happens? He starts paying attention to the wind. He doesn't say that the, the waves scare him. He starts paying attention to something that doesn't matter at all. And in doing that, he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to sink. He was doing the impossible just a moment before until he starts being worried about something that doesn't matter at all. If it said he got concerned because the waves were washing over him, then I'd say, yeah, that makes total sense. But he's just being blown around a little bit. But he's walking on the water. And so he sees the wind. He gets scared. He gets terrified, the passage says, and he begins to, to sink. And in sinking, he cries out, Lord, save me. And much of what we think about how Jesus responds to Thomas when he first encounters him, we often think of that as a rebuke, and we also think of what Jesus says to Peter here as a rebuke as well, because he says, you of little faith. But just a few chapters later, in chapter 17 of Matthew, Jesus will say, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can do what? You can move mountains. If you have just a little bit of faith, you can move mountains. And so, I think Peter has just a little bit of faith here. Remember, 92% of the disciples stay in the boat. Only one gets out. And so, I don't think this is a rebuke of Peter, of his faith, or of his fear. I think... What he's saying is, why did you doubt that I would save you? Did you think that I would let you sink underneath the waves and drown? That, I think, is what Jesus is calling Peter out about, saying, you were just walking on the water, for God's sake. Keep walking. Don't be terrified. Trust that I'm going to save you and that I'm going to be with you. That his doubt is not about his faith but about doubting God's presence, about doubting that Jesus would save him when he begins to sink. He had to know that Jesus was always going to save him. And now, hopefully, he does know that and recognize that Jesus was going to be with him when he's walking on the water and when he's sinking under the water and Jesus is going to lift him right back up again. That Jesus would be with him and with the disciples in the midst of the storms of their life. And so hearing this story should help us then make it easier for us to overcome our own fears, our own worries. Even our own doubts of saying, if I had just this much faith, I could do it. And Jesus says, you have that. And if you have a little faith, you can move mountains. And so stepping out of the boat does not mean that we won't face troubles and high winds and storms that are battering us or waves that are battering us. It doesn't mean that we won't have more fear. But it's to trust that Jesus is right there with us and Jesus will save us. And to know that it is Jesus 
who is calling us out of the boat. Bishop Will Willimon said, if Peter had not ventured forth, had not obeyed the call to walk on water, then Peter would have never had this great opportunity to be rescued by Jesus. I wonder if too many of us are merely splashing about in the safe shallows and therefore have too few opportunities to test and deepen our faith. If you want to be close to Jesus, he says, you have to, be, you have to venture forth out into the sea. That is, you have to be willing to step out of the boat. And that means that we ultimately have to trust and move through our fears, and that is so hard to do. Because last week when I talked about faith, I quoted from some who said that the opposite of faith is not doubt, that it's certainty or control of having things that we can trust and believe in, sort of black and white world, that everything is firm and nothing is going to change and we can comprehend it all, we can wrap it up in a nice little box, tie a bow on it. And fear is much the same thing. Max Lucado says, fear at its center is about a perceived loss of control. And I'm not sure I'm willing to concede that every fear is a loss of control because there are some irrational fears I have that I want to hold on to. But I do think he's actually right. And I, for one, can say that, you know, when I get the most anxious, when I get angry the most, it's when I've lost control of something or something is spiraling outside of my control or I know that I have no control over what it is that's happening. And so what I want to do is I want to wrest that control and grab it so that my life makes sense again. Think about all the problems that some politicians and certain television commentators want us to be concerned about. Nearly all of them are about things that we don't have control over or things we thought we had control over but probably really didn't or things we never had control over. And their solutions are ways to either have us take control or have the perception that we might be in control. And the biggest problem with fear and control, Lucado says, is that when we are fearful, then safety and control become our God. Let me say that again. When we are striving for safety and control, it becomes our God. It becomes the thing we search and seek after. And it also then says that we're going to try to live a risk-free life. But you cannot have lots of things in this world, including love and faith, without taking risks. Without risking losing it all. Right? Those who work to save their lives will lose everything. Those who lose everything, including their lives, will gain everything. When we feed our fears, Lucado says, we starve our faith. When we starve our fears, we feed our faith. But there's one other key piece of this story. Is that not only was Peter's faith changed by him stepping out of the boat, but the other disciples' faith was changed as well. Because we're no longer told that they are afraid. Presumably the storm is still taking place. We're not told that, that Jesus calms the storm. But when Peter and, James, Peter and Jesus get back in the boat, what do they all do? They worship Jesus. They bow down to him. That Peter's courage in stepping out of the boat has changed the other disciples' faith as well. Which means that when we have fear about something that God is calling us to do, and we say, oh, please go find somebody else, that's a Moses story too, that not only are we hurting our faith, but we might also be hindering the faith of others who are looking to us as examples of how to live a Christian life. That by Peter showing his courage to step out of the boat, the other disciples grew in faith as well. 
But Peter stepped out of the boat still fearful, I think. We're not told that he stopped being fearful. But he leaned into that fear. That he understood, as we hear in 1 Timothy, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. Instead, we're called to recognize our fears and say, yep, it's there. But that God is calling us to move beyond them and through them to something bigger. And so here's a few simple steps of how we work to do that. The first is simply to name your fear. What is it you're afraid of? Because often our our failure to name it makes it bigger than it actually is and scarier. And this isn't just saying it to yourself. It's saying it out loud or writing it down to name your fears, right? Those who are familiar with Harry Potter, people can't say Voldemort, the the name of the the chief um, evil guy in in the books, right? Because naming it somehow makes it scarier. No, naming it removes much of the power of it. So say what it is that you fear, and it loses much of its power to stop us from doing things. And the second is to play worst-case scenario. That is, if what you fear will happen actually happened, what would that look like? Right? Because often what we think is going to be worst-case scenario is this terrible thing, but until we actually say it, It has more power of us. And once we actually say it, then we realize, well, yeah, that's worst case. But what's the actual likelihood of that happening? Right? There's lots of people who are terrified of terrorism. Right? That's a big fear we have. Did you know you are more likely to be killed by a cow than you are a terrorist? You're more likely to have a television fall on you and kill you than you are to be killed by a terrorist. You're more likely to be smothered by your pillow while you are sleeping than you are to be killed by a terrorist. Is anybody here terrified of cows? Spiders I get, cows, okay, we have a little cow fear over here. Televisions, pillows, right? Those are more dangerous to us, but this other thing out there has this enormous power over us. And we think that's what we need to avoid. So play out. Worst case scenarios. And then tell somebody else what it is that you fear and why. Right? That's not just naming it out loud. It's getting somebody else to help carry this burden with you. And it might be sometimes you just say, I just need to say this. I don't need anything. Right? Don't give me an answer about how to overcome this. This is not looking for advice. I just need to say this so I can name it. But sometimes you might be looking for advice about how do I help overcome this. And then finally, and maybe you should actually do this first, is to pray. Right? Say, God, this is what I'm scared of. And I hear you calling me to do this, and I don't want to do it. So give me the strength to work through this so I can do what you are calling us to do. And what all these steps will do is to take that fear out of darkness, right? Because fear feeds on darkness. And it's in darkness that we are most terrified. It takes that darkness and that fear and it moves us into the lights. Because things don't seem as scary in the light as they do in the darkness, do they? Because the darkness is where fear dwells. But we are followers. We live in the light because we are followers of Jesus who is the light of the world. And so when Jesus says, do not be afraid, I don't think he's saying live fear free. Because not only is that not healthy, it's dangerous. Instead, he's saying, move through your fears. Don't allow your fears to stop you from doing what God is calling us to do. Don't let your fears stop you from believing that Jesus will save us. Don't let your fears stop you from believing that God is with us even in the storms of life. 
Because what happens is that Peter expands his understanding of what he is capable of. Because he walks on the water. And he expands the faith of the disciples. And he learns to trust that Jesus is always there to save him. He doesn't have to call out, Lord, save me. Jesus is right there to extend his hands and lift him up. Just as Jesus is there for us. But he steps out of the boat. And it doesn't mean that we won't have bad things happen to us in our lives. That there won't be storms that rage around us, that, that torment us and batter us. But Jesus says, this chaos is not going to rule forever. God is going to have the final word on this. That Jesus will ultimately save. And it says, if you're going to get out of the boat, guess what? You might get a little wet. But you can't, right? Safe, safe place to be is in the boat. But that's not the faithful place to be. And we have to get out of the boat. Knowing that Christ is present for us. That Jesus isn't in the boat shivering with them, fearful of the storm. Jesus is standing outside the boat as well, saying, Come, it's I. I am. Do not be afraid. Get out of the boat. Take heart and do not be afraid. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. And so I'm going to invite you to take out your worship guides. And we're going to take that minute again. I want you to write things down that you... Either need to remember or to name some of those fears, talk about some of the things that are stopping you from doing things that you need to be doing in your life or that God is calling uh, you to do. And we're going to take a minute um, to write those things down on your worship guide or for those who are worshiping online on a piece of paper that you have there with us. So if you'll start that countdown. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to follow our YouTube channel and Twitter, and like us on Facebook if you haven't already. And remember that every action you take today could change someone's life. So make sure it's a good one, and be an agent of love. God bless.